Hello everyone, Strappy here. I am incredibly surprised at the reception that I received for my initial anesthesia story with Officer Kendrick. So I was told by some of my friends to take some of my actual anesthesia encounters and start making stories. So I decided I would do that. I actually had my left hip MRI done this uh, last Wednesday and um, my hip is still kind of sore because that whole thing just pisses off the pelvic splenic nerve and everything and yeah my nerves just get pissed off really easy and then even worse is that because I'm not really male or female it's a very complex situation but let's just leave it at there's some genetic fuckery that's gone on that's resulted in me having half of female genome, half of male genome, and kind of uh, Kleinfelters, half-ass Kleinfelters, because uh, female breast tissue on this side, regular breast tissue there. So, right, anyhow, um, kind of getting a bit uh, diverted. Um, so, yeah, everybody actually said start making stories, so I made my left hip MRI. I did this all based off the best of my memories. Um, lots of anxiety that day. I have changed names, ages, and locations, but the story is 100% real events for the most part. There might be a few parts where I had to take a 4-inch fish and make it a 12-inch fish just to make things fit. Um, anyhow, Let's get things started, and uh, I'll jump right in. Those of you who didn't want to hear that long intro, there's actually a button down in the uh, description to skip straight to the story. The MRI left hip. It was a hurried morning for 35-year-old Vince. He talking to a friend on the phone while also dealing with a cascading failure of phone and network equipment in the house, all while getting ready for a much-anticipated MRI with anesthesia. Vince had always loved getting anesthesia. A half hour before Vince needed to be in the pre-op area, his partner Eric came downstairs shouting, What's wrong with computers? I'm trying to print something. Fix it! Vince continued talking on the phone while also trying to fix the problem with the remote tools as his phone was also giving him problems. When Eric then shouted, Fuck it! We don't have time! Go to the car! I'll deal with it later! After his shouting fit and him storming out of the house to the car, Vince felt his heart racing and yelled, I don't need you yelling at me when I was told this morning they aren't sure if they can get anesthesia and interventional radiology. He then pulled his Apple Watch up to his eyes and took a look at his heart rate, which was soaring at 161. In a solid anxiety and panic attack, he said, That's the sound of a cancelled MRI. After a few minutes, he managed to muster the strength to face getting into the car with Eric. Knowing that with a heart rate that high, he would either get his MRI or at the very least get medicated in the emergency room. As he sat in the car, he said in an almost cinematic tone, the way you'd hear in a movie after a person steals classified documents and gets into the getaway car. Not a word, just drive. Eric pulled onto the roadway and to the hospital they went. En route to the hospital, Vince kept checking his heart rate. He spoke to himself under his breath. Yeah, we're code 3, red hot cardiac. 141 unstable with palpitations. Fuck, I'm going to end up in an emergency room instead of MRI. The hospital's ambulatory surgery entrance had long since been set as an exit only for security reasons. So everyone going to the ambulatory surgery center needed to check in at the emergency room entrance. Vince, having gone to the hospital so many times, just walked past casually wearing a scrub shirt and pants. Looking the part, nobody must have taken any care. 
Narrowly cutting off a patient being returned from the surgical area, Vince slipped into the pre-post procedure unit. He looked behind himself to see that the cart with the patient didn't come into the unit and must have turned another way. He thought to himself, eh, guess that was a narrowly avoided patient bed collision. He then slid his way down the desk with an air of, I'm a frequent flyer, and slid his ID card across the desk. And quickly said, Vince here for a 115 hip MRI with general anesthesia. ID's right there. I'll be over there at the Topaz if you need my signatures. Vince referred to the signature capture tablet on the desk opposite the area where he slid his ID to the clerk. As she worked on the computer, another nurse, clearly very tired, spoke of coffee, to which Vince said, I'm sure you got a coffee machine back there. What's holding you back from hitting it again? I'm not going to complain unless it's after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then I'll chide you for drinking coffee too late. To which the woman laughed, stood up, and went into the office workroom. The nurse working on my paperwork shouted, that's dirt in that jar. I think that's from this morning shift at 5 o'clock a.m. when we started first cases. You best make a new batch. Vince said to the woman checking him in, What, no Keurig? No single-serve coffee maker? No sterility and guarantee that you're not getting someone else's germs with your coffee? The woman sighed and looked back at her computer, continuing the check-in paperwork. She said happily, no signatures needed, I've got your ID and insurance cards already scanned, I'll just print a bracelet and you'll be in bed one. Vince was impressed by this bed position, as he always had gotten beds across the wall from the desk, like bed 8 or 9 or 10 or 12, but bed 1 and 2 sat right next to the OR and imaging hallway. The woman gave Vince a bracelet and escorted him to the room. He said jokingly, so I had enough miles to upgrade to the VIP pre-post suite, huh? Right next to the doors to ORs and imaging. The woman was, during the whole time, very tired and unenthused by anything. She left and a pair of nurses returned. They brought with them a PPE cart and hung an isolation precaution sign. Vince looked around confused for a few seconds, almost nervous. Already anxious and frazzled from the argument with Eric, his heart rate very high and nerves at best rattled. He watched the nurses put on familiar blue plastic gowns and walk in with gloves and masks on. The nurses said, Isolation for prior MRSA, nothing new. Vince said, Probably better off for my safety. After all, you guys are masked, gowned, and gloved which means I'm not likely to get something off of you that easy either. I get sick very easy. I had community-acquired MRSA pneumonia a bunch of years ago and RSV bronchiolitis last month. Let me emphasize bronchiolitis. The nurses laughed, and some casual chat continued. Then the saline bag came into the room. Vince groaned and looked at it nervously. <clears throat> he gulped a few times and said to the nurse knowing an ivy kit was not too far behind you get one stick this is your gamble because if you miss I'm going to force you to gas me down before you IV me if you want to gamble with my hand that's your call if you want to go for the AC I'd say that's your safe conservative bet with a low risk of losing. The nurse began looking at Vince's veins. She then parodied one on his hand and said, Well, this is a nice juicy one on your hand here. Vince looked at the vein and said, Oh yeah? My veins like to roll. That's another advisory. You really want to gamble, huh? You ready to get forced to gas me down? The nurse began to get a bit nervous. She said, okay, let's not do the hand then. This one on your wrist looks kind of nice, but that area has a lot of nerves. Mm. Vince said, mm, no. The nurse said, I agree. Um, how's about this one on the left side of your forearm? 
not quite your antecubital, but not really near your wrist and all that articulatory muscle. I'll need to sa shave some of this hair off, and uh, the tape will be rather painful when it comes off. Vince looked at her target vein and said, That looks good. 22 gauge or 20, and shave it nice. The nurse shouted, Can I get a 20 gauge and a shaver in bed one? A woman slid by the room and handed off an electric shaver that bore the BD logo, which surprised Vince, who thought, What else do they make? Shavers now? Tomorrow washing machines? The dreaded blue 20 gauge IV line now sat on the bed in its tray. The nurse said, Listen, see my name on my badge? Tamara W. If I screw this up, it's on my name, and it's going to be me who has to explain to the anesthesiologist why they have to gas you down on just SIVA, which is something they really don't like doing without an IV present in case a bronchospasm or another unforeseen anesthesia event occurs. It's different when you're in a main OR, when you can fade in on nitrous oxide and set the IV on 50% nitrous and 50% oxygen with maybe 1% of sevoflurane in there. But without a main OR, it's much harder. Vince appreciated a nurse who knew her way around anesthesia. He winced as she pulled the IV kit open with an audible crunch of the plastic. Vince looked very intently at the IV components. Anesthesiology showed up and greeted Vince. The anesthesiologist, Dr. Aki, was very excited and said, Hey Vince, I'm Dr. Aki. I'm looking forward to working with you in back. Everyone has told me how smart you are and how well you know the anesthesia and you run the show from the table. As Vince and Dr. Aki chatted a few minutes, the nurse placed the IV. Then Dr. Aki looked to his phone as it buzzed and beeped and said, Looks like one of my associates will have to take care of you. I'm getting called stat. Stay well. He ran off. The nurse looked up at the monitor. She was not impressed with the 140 heart rate and said to Vince, I can offer you that 5 milligrams of midazolam that we offered you earlier. Vince had put off the midazolam and told the nurses when he was doing intake that he didn't want any pre-medication and he wanted to feel the gas and remember everything. The nurses were extremely understanding and well knew that this was Vince's happy place, but there was no getting the anesthesia started like this, though. 140 and unstable. No anesthesiology wants to hook that up to their machine unless it's a dire emergency. So, Vince said, give me midazolam. Let's do it. The nurse walked off, and a few minutes later, she returned with the midazolam and pushed it into his IV. Five milligrams. Vince barely felt any effect, but the effect it and his friend chatting to him over the next half hour had brought his heart rate down to 102. One of Vince's friends from the gay chat group said on their Safe for Work channel, Sorry I can't be there. I know how much you like me and my heavy rubber gloves rubbing your head after a play session. Vince replied, I wish I could have you as my anesthesiologist, but I do have good news. My heart rate is good enough that they can take me in back. This was, after all, what had caused Vince's procedure to be delayed by a whole hour, because his heart rate was way too high when intake was taking place. Another anesthesiologist came into the room. A smaller, short, slim, black woman with a beautiful smile said, I'm Dr. Bernadette. I'll be taking over for Dr. Aki. I see you like to run the show, so how do you want me to do this? I see you have a lot of allergies, so propofol is definitely out of the question. Vince began rattling off the procedure, almost as if he were a head anesthesiologist dictating to a subordinate.
We're going to hook it up to the monitor, start pre-oxygenating, start with the sieve fluorine nice and slow, push it up nice and slow until we go down. Then we're going to blind drop a number 6 or a 5.5 ETT in the trach, nice and easy. Then you can do gas maintenance the entire time. Drop a Zofran IV dose before awakening, call it a day, and pull the ETT before awakening occurs. Dr. Bernadette looked at Vince, shocked, and said, so that tracheostomy is patent. Vince said, yeah, just used last month for a surgery at university. Blind dropped a six in there, just gassed me down and dropped it in. Dr. Bernadette was clearly intrigued by this and said, and for the induction, what do we do? Mask and the tracheostomy gets... Vince broke into her sentence and said, we just taggy out the trach site with 2x2 IV taggy and pulled taggy after induction happens. Dr. Bernadette said, perfect, kind of what I was thinking. I was either thinking we would take the mask to your tracheostomy or we would actually cover your trach. Any last questions before I go get things ready in the room? Vince jokingly said, what's 222 trifluoromethyl fluoromethyl ether? Dr. Bernadette said, I was warned I would get a pop quiz. That's the sevafluorine chemical name. Nice try flunking me. I'll see you in back, fun guy. Moments later, a pair of men showed up from transport, and Vince was whisked off to interventional radiology. Into a cramped room, the cart rolled. Vince looked around this strange, very small room. It barely fit him and the staff, a radiologist, a nurse, a CRNA, and the anesthetist. Packed into the tight room was the fluoroscope, the x-ray procedure cart, the vital signs monitor for anesthesia, and Vince looked around and said, Where's the anesthesia machine? Dr. Bernadette chuckled and said, I have to go run over to the MRI and grab it along with the 5.5 and number 6 ETTs. I'll be right back. Vince started looking around very eagerly as the nurses hooked him up to the monitor and put the blood pressure cuff on. This wasn't his normal excitement, though. Vince was actually nervous and rattled. The episode with Eric no help earlier. And it didn't help that earlier in pre-op, Vince was told that they might have problems getting anesthesia into the interventional radiology where they would be preparing Vince for his hip MRI by injecting contrast into a joint. Vince told them profusely in pre-op, You must have general gas anesthesia for me. That long hip aspiration needle is a harp, nope, nope, nope needle. That is a hard nope. They reassured Vince he would get the anesthesia, but no amount of reassurance was enough until Vince looked around and saw the anesthesia machine roll in behind him with a metallic clatter. The whole air in the room changed from an electrical tenseness, almost panic, to an organized calm, maybe even excitement. Even more, once Vince heard the anesthesiologist connect the machine to the power and gas lines, the leak tones, eliciting an excitement in Vince like nothing else in the world could. Just five sequential notes played by this machine in a specific manner that made Vince's mild mind go into a state of total overdrive and excitement. What people would usually sexually call the climax is what happens when Vince simply gets around live anesthesia equipment about to be used on him. Yet his heart continued to race until onto the transport cart thumped a familiar object, a green plastic mask with green ventilator tubings. While Vince wasn't used to the green tubings or green mask, usually seeing blue, the mask and its soft inflatable padding immediately was familiar. Before the anesthesiologist had even positioned it properly or put a tachyderm on his tracheostomy, he grabbed the mask greedily pulling it to his face tightly. The anesthesiologist quickly repositioned the tubing and turned on the oxygen hastily, grabbing a tachyderm and slapping it onto his tracheostomy.
Vince's heart began to slow as he greedily took heavy breaths from the oxygen. The anesthesiology had set the machine up, and the airway was somewhat resistive feeling and heavy. Vince didn't remember the anesthesia machine airway always being this resistive. It must have been set up this way, probably with intent of forcing him to slow down and relax. The tegaderm slightly leaking. He used his right hand intermittently to make sure he wasn't going to leak any gases once they turned on the Siva fluorine. The anesthesiologist continued to monitor hookups and tested monitoring equipment and said, I'm impressed. That's some serious pre-oxygenating you're doing there. Vince would usually make jokes and talk with the staff, but his anxiety was so high he could only hold the mask to his face ever so tight. Holding it on to his face tighter than he had ever held a mask to his face before. The anesthesiologist was very well aware that Vince was in great distress, his heart rate racing on the monitor, the red alarm lights on it flashing through the entire procedure. After connecting all the monitors, she said, I'm turning on the SIVO now. You'll smell it. Vince heard a click of the vaporizer and said delightedly, I smell it! 222-trifluoromethylfluoromethylether. Good old SIVO. He took a greedy, massive breath and then took another and took one after another. The only thing preventing him from hyperventilating, the resistive, thick nature of the anesthesia machine's airway, surely programmed that way ahead of time because they knew Vince was gas-greedy so gas greedy that he frequently caused machines to leak tone as he collapsed the rebreather bag at many hospitals. Now hospitals know very well to have the largest rebreather bag available on the machine or to expect leak tones. Vince held the mask tight. At first the tingling started at his hands and toes along within his lungs and chest. It was strongest as he inhaled and exhaled the delightful gas, growing stronger with each inhalation. What struck exceptionally strange this time, though, was how the initial effect spread outward from his trachea into his lungs and beyond, almost as if Vince could feel the sevaflorine entering his bloodstream in slow motion entering his lungs, flowing through his pulmonary veins until hitting his heart, becoming a slow explosion of tingling across his entire body, spreading from his heart, outward down his legs, and across his arms, through his abdomen, and across his chest, as he gripped that mask tighter and tighter, even though his hand quickly became numb. The anesthesiologist just stared on from the head of the bed, almost impressed by Vince's ability to stay conscious this long. Vince continued deeper and deeper into the warm, tingling grip of the Siva fluorine as it spread out across his body with ease, with each greedy breath he took from the mask. His grip on the mask slowly becoming more relaxed, going from a panicked tight grip to a grip of a man relaxed and about to induce. Vince felt an unusual warm sensation across him as the tingling became extremely intense. The room began to spin and sounds began to blur, some echoing. The nurses and anesthesiologists making some small procedural comments. Anesthesia start time, uh, 1428, um, using PSV and preparing for number six blind drop. 
mass conduction standard on a sieve of fluorine. All of this happening and the sounds becoming even more and more blurred, the cardiac monitor's beeps become a complete blur of sound before he's swallowed into the warm, dark embrace of anesthesia. He lets out a guttural shout. Good old Sivo! As he faded out of reality. His last words of the anesthetic excitation phase. Never did Vince hold his last words back during excitation. Almost always shouting his classic, Good old Sivo! Then, Vince was unconscious, asleep. They draped his hip, inserted a 22-gauge needle, advanced it into the joint, and injected the MRI contrast. After that, they took a picture confirming that the contrast was in the correct position. Then, Vince was moved back onto the transport cart, and they carefully rushed him to the MRI room with an anesthesia machine running on a battery backup. In the MRI room, things were a little bit more calm. They connected the anesthesia machine up to power and gas lines and got Vince into the MRI scanner and began the scan. The scan was completed uneventfully. Vince then awoke in the post-operative care unit, his mouth extremely dry and his hips sore. Without pain medicine ordered, he could only wait for the discharge packet to print. The nurse asked, How far is your caregiver? Vince told the woman, Five minutes out, he has a lead foot. The woman took Vince's vitals and said, You've awoken very quickly, so we don't need to hold you here in phase one. I'll call your caregiver and get you to pre-post procedure unit so you can get ready to go home. Vince smiled at her and then a transport team showed up and off to the pre-post procedure unit Vince was taken. Vince met with the nurse he had at the start. She pulled the IV line out and wrapped it quickly with copious compression bandages. Vince grabbed on putting additional pressure over the pressure wrap saying, 30 seconds, not going to lose this nice vein, I'm holding on to this thing, I have to use it again next month. The nurse looked up and smiled and said, I'll call your caregiver, you get dressed at your leisure. The curtain was drawn closed. Vince kept the pressure on the vein for another minute or so, before quickly slipping his clothes on. A wheelchair then arrived. Vince told the nurse that his caregiver had arrived and he was parked outside. The nurse took Vince to the waiting car and Vince and his caregiver, Eric, drove home. After a long day at the hospital, Vince was tired. He and Eric hammered out the problems with the phones and then Vince laid down to go to sleep and slept a good night. Though the whole next day, even if it wasn't the top thing on his mind or being talked about, as if it wasn't something always on his mind, even if it was just in the back of his mind, Vince couldn't help but think about his next date with his girlfriend at the hospital named Esteva S5.